Today, we come to our last, our final lesson uh, on this occasion in Thessalonians. And uh, next week, we will turn uh, to a, a new type of study. We'll be studying in the Old Testament uh, beginning, uh, beginning next week. And uh, our, uh, our next study will be from the second book of Kings. It will certainly be a different kind of study from uh, what we have had in uh, studying Paul's letters to a, uh, <laughs> to a Greek world in the first century. We will actually go back in time about a thousand years to the beginning of King Solomon's reign uh, as we begin our new study next week. But meanwhile, today we will uh, wrap up our study of uh, Paul's final word to Thessalonica with, uh, <laughs> with a lesson entitled, Waiting. Uh, we'll have a, a little review here before we go uh, ahead or before we say goodbye to Thessalonica. Remember, Paul went to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey, he was with Luke and Timothy and Silas, uh, along with some protective friends from uh, Philippi and Berea. Remember that there were some problems going on there, and they sent uh, they sent some bodyguards with Paul to take help take care of him. Uh, after making a number of converts there in uh, in Thessalonica. Uh, Paul was forced on to Athens, and then he, from Athens, went on to Corinth, where he waited for the others to catch up with him. Uh, while he was there, he, he received word by letter that, that there were some problems and disturbances uh, concerning uh, beliefs in the church in Thessalonica. So these two letters that we have studied uh, during this time uh, were to calm the uncertainties of the new believers, particularly concerning or related to the return of Christ to earth, to receive the redeemed, and to establish his kingdom. Now, according to the report, there were some troublemakers who had infiltrated the congregation. Apparently, they were either Judaizers or people who were just uh, trying to destroy the fellowship of the congregation. We're not certain uh, exactly who they were. But uh, in this last word that Paul has to, to write here to Thessalonia, he will remind the people there, again, because he, he's repeating some things here that uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians that he has already said in 1 Thessalonians, and he'll be uh, reminding them of the teachings that he had given them as well as giving them a final word of, uh, of encouragement. He will insist on the fact that they must keep on living and loving and working until Jesus comes. Uh, we are still waiting for, for Jesus' return, and uh, the command is effective uh, for us as well, that we must continue uh, to, to work and to witness until he arrives. Waiting, the word waiting, is an interesting word. Uh, sometimes waiting is boring. Uh, some waiting is sad. Other waiting is rather tantalizing, uh, even, even with joyful anticipation. Uh, waiting for the morning, for example, to come when someone is seriously ill uh, is a terrible wait. And if you're hungry and you're waiting for dinner, it can be a little anxiety producing. If you're waiting for someone to wake up, if you're planning an early morning trip, uh, it can make you a little nervous if they oversleep. Uh, waiting for someone's arrival home when they are already an hour late gives us cause for concern. Uh, waiting in an emergency room for what seems like hours sometimes makes us feel rather uncomfortable. Uh, waiting in line with friends for a concert or for an anticipated play can be a great time for good conversation. Uh, and waiting for a holiday can, can excite great thoughts. Uh, Paul tells the church in Thessalonica 
that waiting for the Lord's return and talking about it uh, should bring them confidence and joy. At the same time, he's going to remind them that while waiting, life must go on and that a positive witness must characterize their daily walk with Christ. Our first verses for today comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, where Paul is going to reemphasize some teachings he had already expressed to them. This time he uses the word command, uh, and he uses his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he's going to establish a, uh, a rather firm standard for conduct concerning work. Uh, this will be the second time to deal with this question uh, in, in these two letters. And I'll read those, uh, those verses. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Uh, but with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model to you so that you would follow our example. Uh, we'll notice from these verses that uh, Paul gives, uh, <laughs> give this command, gives this command in the name of Jesus. That's about as authoritative as, uh, as he could get, I suppose. He says that we should not make book at all with idle or lazy folks. He points out that he and his fellow travelers worked hard and gave, uh, gave the example of a Christian attitude toward personal responsibility and personal uh, work. Uh, not only, he says, were we not lazy, we did not depend on you. He says, we took nothing from anyone as an expected gift. He points out again that the whole group had worked night and day so as not to be dependent on anyone or burden anyone with their upkeep. Remember, Paul was a tent maker, and probably the group, the group with, uh, with which he traveled or with whom he traveled probably uh, had, a, uh, had a transitory business of uh, making tents and selling them to the travelers who were moving back and forth uh, across the world at that time. He says, we didn't burden anybody with, uh, with, with our upkeep. He says at the same time, it would have been acceptable for them to provide the necessities of life for those who were busy teaching and preaching. But uh, since this is the very beginning of the work, uh, he did not wish to give any impression at all that they were there looking for personal benefit. Uh, you know, it's interesting, our missionaries even today uh, and uh, of course, I, I went to, I went out a number of years ago as a missionary, and, and it's still true. Our missionaries still do not uh, ask anything at all uh, from the people with whom we're working. Our missionaries still do the same thing uh, that uh, we do not burden new believers with our financial support uh, as churches grow and mature and begin to have their own pastors, naturally that's going to change. Uh, a, for example, when I went first to Ecuador, we had no national pastors at all, and there were only three little tiny churches in the whole country. Uh, today, there are over 300 churches in Ecuador with uh, national pastors, and those national pastors receive salaries from their churches. Uh, paid by the congregation. They have even sent missionaries uh, to Africa and to India 
So uh, they, uh, as, as churches grow and mature, they take on more responsibility. But in the very beginning, it's, uh, it's always very convenient to, to be an example setter uh, rather than a getter. Now, in, in the next paragraph, Paul will double down on the, this concept of personal responsibility. Uh, and, of course, he's, the whole thing is that we're waiting for the arrival of the Lord. And apparently some folks there in Thessalonica had thought he was coming back next week. <laughs> So they, uh, they stopped working, apparently, and uh, just visited whoever had lunch ready. Uh, but Paul's going to say that one sign of spiritual maturity is personal responsibility uh, and the ability, of course, to provide for yourself. And the, these next verses are from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we continue with verses 10, 11, and 12 of chapter 3. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Uh, so here, Paul is. Uh, you almost uh, you can almost uh, hear uh, hear the uh, the uh, the anger, or at least the frustration uh, in Paul's heart as he writes these kind of words, or as he speaks these words, and and uh, Sylvanus or whoever happened to be his secretary at that time was writing. Paul reminds them that he had already said that anyone mooching off others while waiting for the Lord's return should not be invited to the table. <laughs> uh, and it's quite direct here. He says, if anyone is not willing to work, he should not eat either. Uh, more direct, it is hard to get. He points out that an idle mind is certainly the devil's workshop. For those who were not busy working apparently had become disruptive busybodies. Uh, he became adamant here at the thought, and he says he exhorts and demands. So uh, Paul, is, uh, Paul is quite upset about, uh, about the news that he has received about some people being uh, terrible slackers. Uh, and he says that these people, he demands that these people get a job and just shut up their idle chatter and talking nonsense and provide for themselves. Uh, and then uh, he remembers the responsible folks, probably the people who are, who are reading this now, because he's going to say, as for you, because our final verses today are verses 13, 14, and 15 of chapter 3. And he says, but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary of will of doing good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So we see here that Paul now turns to to the faithful ones uh, there in the church uh, for a final word before he gets to his goodbye verses at the very end of the chapter. Uh, for those faithful who are carrying the heavy load of responsibility, he encourages them to not grow weary in doing good while they await the coming of the Lord. Now, in this part of the letter, Paul does not mention the Lord's return, but that's what has been the cause of the whole problem from the beginning of, uh, of his letters to the church in Thessalonica. So we hear here now, as, and as he closes this second letter, we hear our apostle repeat his position of authority as a spiritual leader of the new church. Uh, he is insistent that uh, we do not spend our time with those who cast dispersion on the body of Christ or on, uh, also, we are not to treat them as enemies, 
but they are to be clearly informed that this type of behavior is not acceptable. Uh, we've had some great teachings uh, as we've looked at Paul's letters here to the folks in Thessalonica. Uh, the, uh, the brothers and sisters were brand new in the faith, and Paul was setting some good examples for them and giving them firm instructions about what it, what it uh, means to give a Christian testimony. Uh, and so we close our study uh, with, uh, with a few final uh, indications that, uh, that we also should do work and be working as we wait for our Lord's return. I've listed uh, eight ideas here as the closing thought uh, for this lesson today. Number one, there are standards to be maintained as believers in Christ Jesus. Uh, we know that the whole world is, is watching us, and, and we even watch each other. <laughs> Number two, we are individually responsible as believers. Uh, the Lord deals with us on an individual basis, and each one of us have responsibilities as believers in the Lord Jesus. Uh, we are certainly responsible before, responsible before the church to honor our Lord with a Christian character and maintain the good testimony uh, of the body of Christ. And number four, generosity is a definitely is definitely a Christian virtue, uh, but to promote idleness is certainly not honorable. Uh, and we notice that Paul was quite insistent on that throughout this entire letter. Number five, uh, we are to hold each other responsible as members of the body of Christ. We are responsible to each other. We, we are not an island unto ourselves, but we are a part of the body of Christ. So we hold each other responsible. Number six, the consequences of disobedience always hurts the witness to the world, as well as destroying the fellowship and the communion within the church. So disobedience, uh, uh, simply, <laughs> disobedience is always uh, something that we should avoid at, uh, at all costs. Number seven, we are to be careful of our primary group of friends. Paul says, avoid being identified with busybodies. Uh, we, uh, we have lots of sayings in our language concerning uh, how to identify people. Uh, one of them, of course, is let me, know your, let me know your friends and I'll tell you what kind of person you are. So Paul says, be careful of our primary group of friends. And we're to avoid being identified with those who are busybodies. And number eight. Prayer for others keeps us in harmony with each other. Paul asked them to pray for him. He says he will be uh, praying for the church, and he asked the church to pray for them. And and uh, as we have seen in another place where he here in the in the same letter, he had asked them to pray for him that he would be able to continue sharing the gospel uh, into that Greco-Roman world into which he had been ordered by the very spirit of the living God to take the gospel. And we're thankful that he did. We're so glad he made it to Thessalonica and planted the church there. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love to us and for your concern for us. And we thank you, Lord, for people like the Apostle Paul, who, who was willing to follow your instructions and has spread the gospel around the world. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd use each one of us in our own particular place, that we would share the blessings of the, of the, the saving power of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen.